Well, Mark, man, it's good to have a chat with you. I think, uh, as we were saying earlier, a lot of people have been telling us that we need to get together and have a conversation. So yeah. the world has manifested this. It has. And hopefully we deliver <laughs> yeah. for the world. I feel like the expectations are high. Like if we come home without gold, we're going to be like the conquistadors looking for El Dorado and it's... just coming back with fucking mosquito bites. <laughs> there's uh, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people out there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, maybe that's something we should not give a fuck about, right? I'm all about preparing for the worst, so. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, got a chance to read some of your most recent articles, and I think it's interesting, you know, transitioning both from life and into relationship and how kind of all of that coincides. And ex- you're yeah. expanding your definition of relationship when you're talking about toxic relationship. Everybody thinks about your romantic relationships. Right. But – it's really everything. Yeah. It's really just attachment in general. Yeah. I, I started to notice this with a lot of people that would email me or that I talk to. Um, you know, people who, who are total fuck up. I can use, I can say fuck. Fuck right? yeah, you okay. can. Awesome. How uh, the fuck would we have this podcast <laughs> <laughs> if we couldn't say that? Like people, people who, are, who fuck up their, their romantic relationships, they tend to, they tend to, they fuck up their friendships. They fuck up their family relationships. Um, they have m- messed up relationships with, you know, their body or their work life or, you know, and, and it, so these, these tendencies, they show up in multiple places. It's just that the, the romantic relationship is often the most visible because it has the most drama. Yeah, it has the. It's kind of the most earth shaking of all the natural disasters. Yes. yes, you know, it throws you off your kilter the most. So, you know, I know that both of us like to get into those self sabotaging patterns. Like, what's at the root of the reason why? If we know that something isn't good for us, like how come we can't fucking do it? Yeah. That's something that, you know, you can really puzzle for a while. And I think there's a lot of oh, answers. Man, there are a lot of answers to that. Uh, I mean, I think in, in terms of the relationships, really kind of the core trait, I guess, of how people mess it up is they're thinking first about getting something and not thinking about what they're giving. And so, so, and there's like obvious examples of this and then there's like really subtle examples of this. So a very obvious example is like, you know, if if I was single and I was going out and I'm like, yeah, I just want to meet a woman with blonde hair and big tits. Like that's all I care about. Like I, I'm trying, I'm going out specifically to get something. Obviously my relationships are probably going to be terrible. Yeah, that's um, like the that's like the buck hunter approach. Yes, you know, where you're just like, <laughs> exactly. I need that twelve pointer. I spotted it in my sights. I got the yeah. game camera set up, and I'm hunting yeah. for it. Yeah. So I mean that, it, and it's the same thing. Like people who take jobs just for the money, or or um, you know, people who go home for the holidays just because their family, like j- you know, just a curry favor with an aunt who gives them money or something. Like those are the obvious examples that we all know. Like that's. Mm -hmm. that's leading you down a path of destruction and misery. But then there's a lot of, there's a lot more subtle ways that we do this too is, is for instance, you know, if I felt unappreciated by my mother growing up and then I use the women I date to compensate for that insecurity, that's also a way in which it's just like going out and looking for a blonde with big tits it's just way more subtle. It's harder for me to see. Like, I don't yeah. even know that I'm doing it. Um, and so if I enter a relationship with that mindset of like, this is why I'm in the relationship to get this validation to like compensate for myself. Um, what that, what happens is, is that as soon as my partner does something that doesn't validate me, I'm going to lose my shit and be like, why am I here? I hate this person. Um, and so you can't, you can't have a functional relationship that way though, you know, for a functional relationship of anything, both people need to be allowed to say no to each other Mm -hmm. at some point. You know what I realized, man, and I had this realization just pretty recently. I feel like we're all playing out this courtroom drama and the drama is called proof of love yeah. <laughs> and we're always the prosecutor and everybody around us, we're trying to get them to prove that they love yeah. us and we'll bring them up to the stand and we'll be like, you stand accused of not loving me. I present to you exhibit a, you know, yeah. how do you plead? And they're like, not guilty. I love you. And you're like, aha, well, yeah. look at this evidence. You said this in this text message and you ignored me here. Now, what do you say? Like, I'm sorry, I fucking still love you. You're like, no, it's not enough. Like, just constantly get trying to prove 
you know, that other people love us to yeah. validate us, to make sure that we feel like we're worthy of love. Yeah. And you know? it's, it's, and one of the worst habits of relationship, like this is where I call it the laundry list is like whenever a couple starts fighting, usually a lot of times there's at least one person in the couple, sometimes both who like has this checklist in their head of all the shit that the other person did over like the last five years. The accumulation of evidence. So, yeah. yeah. So it's like, as soon as you like forget to switch the laundry, it's like, well, you didn't do the dishes last month either. And yeah. in that time that I visited my mom, like you didn't offer to drive. And it's like, oh my God, like suddenly mm-hmm. just this whole, you know, barrage of things come out. Um, and, and it's, you know, when, when there's like this laundry list like that, it's, it's usually because, you know, like you said, it's the person they're trying to make a case. They're trying to prove, uh, you know, that a certain quota of love and affection wasn't met. And it's like if you approach a relationship like that, like you can't. Right. You know, it's the, like begging the question. You know, it's like already having the answer in your head and your answer is they don't love me enough. Yeah. And then you're trying to gather all the fucking evidence you can well, to back that up instead of just looking at the truth. Like, of course they love me. Maybe they got a little distracted or confused yeah, or whatever. And, it, and it's I mean, this this isn't like your tax return. Like you can't quantify <laughs> this shit. Like you can't yeah. be like can't be like, oh, well. She did she did the laundry three times last week. That means she loves me. If she did it twice, then she probably you know, you can't do that. There's no yardstick for this stuff. But like, what if it's three times they did laundry and you had anal sex? Then it might then <laughs> it might be love. that's true love. It is true love. Then it might be love. <laughs> that's called soulmates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I also realized that too. Like part of my proof of love was part courtroom drama and part porno. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like all of the ways that, you know, you try to get someone to prove that, you know, they really care about you. Yeah, it's, it's just a funny thing. And then then ultimately how much easier it is to relax when you just operate from the assumption that they do love you. Yeah. And then, you know, be willing to look at evidence to the contrary. Yeah. But like truly love and, you know. Until it's not love, you know, yeah. like innocent until proven guilty. Like assume love until like really there's enough there's real like, hard evidence. Yeah, obvious, yeah. <laughs> you know, or or the person just says it. You know, like just trust them. Just <laughs> yeah. be like, hey, oh whoa, yeah, you I can know, do right? that too. <laughs> you can trust That's them. fucking <laughs> crazy. Everybody could just be honest, and then you wouldn't have to play out these fucking dramas all the time. Just communicate. No, that's just. No, that's that's crazy. Yeah. We just got off. Sorry, everybody. We <laughs> we just went into fantasy land I know, I know. where people are honestly communicating. It's a reality based podcast. I think you know it's funny. Uh, I think Bertrand Russell was talking about how if everybody could read everybody's minds for the first few days, everybody would just huddle in a house. And nobody yeah. would go out because they'd be like horrified, <laughs> you know. But after a few days, everybody would get used to it, and then everybody would be like fucking stoked because yeah. there'd be no secrets. We'd all realize we have fucked up thoughts and our emotions vary. And even with someone we love throughout the day, 10 times during the day, we might say, I fucking love this person so much. Like, man, I think we got to break up. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like all of these crazy thoughts and just these – well, realize that that's just the human nature. Yeah, you know that you vary and cycle between these things, and yeah. you can't really stress about all that stuff. Yeah, I, it's funny because I think a lot of people assume that what what creates intimacy is that somebody accepts like the good things about you. You know, so it's like if, if there's like, oh, I'm a really smart guy and a hard worker, so I need need to find a woman who like appreciates that about me. Like that's true, but the thing is, is that if you find somebody who only appreciates the good things about you. It, you actually start to get skeptical of them, you know? Uh, you you don't actually know why they're there. So, like, what creates intimacy is people who accept the shitty parts about you. Totally. Like, your bad habits, your weird quirks, um, your insecurities. Like, somebody who listens to that and is like, hey, no, you're okay. Like, I'm still here. I still care about you. Like, m- my feelings have not changed. That's what we're going for. And so if you're always hiding those bad things, if you're never talking about them, um, you can never get to that place. Mm. Anytime that you think it's anything about you that causes the love, you're yeah. going to be fucked. Yeah. I've been on this you know, four-year open relationship experiment with my fiance, yeah. and it's really interesting because it challenges all those things oh, that yeah. you think are the reason why <laughs> they love you. And, and what, what I recently realized, too, and which is really fucked up, is that the ego retreats to the areas that you think are the strongest. Yeah. You know what I mean? So even though I was thinking like, no, you know, she loves me for the totality of me. It's the uniqueness. Yeah. I was just me bullshitting myself yeah. and not realizing that my ego had kind of nestled in the one part of me that I thought was the very best in the world. <laughs> you know, like yeah. this, these essential 
traits that I had, these things that I could do that nobody else could. And then, you know, something happened where those got challenged yeah. and I got trumped at my strength. And I was like, oh, fuck. And I was like super shook to the core yeah. because because I didn't trust that it was the totality of me yeah. that was the part. And so and then eventually you have to work through that. And it was a great blessing. Like, oh, man, I can release that. Yeah. But the ego will retreat to those little strongholds until those strongholds yeah, get busted and then, down. And you realize, like, she loves me just for, for being me, yeah. for being alive, for all the good, all the bad, just because of the essential quality of me. It's not any attribute I have or any skill I have or yeah. anything I can do better than someone else. It's just me. Yeah, and, and those strongholds, none of them stay up forever. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> I don't care how the good ego you are. is a shitty builder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, you, can, you can play Game of War all you want, but it's just fucking pixels, and that yeah. shit will get obliterated. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <clears throat> so, not only in, in relationship, um, but you spend a lot of time, obviously, your your book was a fucking massive success. Yeah. Like, shook the world Still up. Still going. Bit. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, read a bit of that and read the article associated to it and i think it's you know a lot of it is just about not not giving fucks for people who haven't read it it's called the subtle art of not yeah, giving yeah. fuck it's not about not giving any fucks it's about choosing where to give your fucks yes like that's the key part of this right <laughs> thank you for actually reading it it's like yeah <laughs> My, like i've done i've done probably a few hundred interviews at this point over the last two years around the book and it's funny because it's like i can always immediately detect who actually read it <laughs> and who didn't based on that question because people who, the the journalists and the podcasters everything who didn't read it they say like oh so why shouldn't we give a fuck about anything and i'm like ah yeah <laughs> you, you, you didn't, didn't get right. past chapter you one give a fuck about yeah exactly exactly <laughs> And then, but because yeah, the book is essentially it's about values. It's about yeah. what what are you choosing to make important in your life, and why is that important? Should it be important? Should something else be more important? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's actually a really you know the joke the joke I always say is like I wanted to write a book about values, but but if I wrote a book about values, nobody would read it. So I like dropped f bombs everywhere. <laughs> to like trick people <laughs> and be like oh this is gonna be cool and gritty like it's like now you get to chapter three and you're like oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> i really have to do work here yeah this is this oh book. man this is painful <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think that's finding out what's really important and i think it again ties back to the ego you yeah. know because the ego will trick you into thinking a lot of bullshit is important oh yeah that that thing you that car that aspect of that car that aspect of this watch or this amount of wealth or money or appearance or whatever is really really important and it'll put that up on a priority list and you'll be chasing that forever until finally realize like why the fuck am i caring so much yeah. about that like yeah. what really matters yeah. at the core of it and until you get past some of those tricks and little spells that the ego will put you under these little delusions yeah it's hard it's hard to prioritize anything yeah yeah, the, I I feel like uh, the ego is kind of like a like a political party or like a, a cheesy politician. Like he, the ego will like think and say anything that helps the ego and like doesn't 100%. give a shit about you. It's, it's just like we don't care if you're healthy and happy. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about how awesome we are. Let's talk about. It's like a little Trump. In yeah, your exactly. Yeah. And it's just like it will contradict itself week to week. <laughs> Like, you know, one second you're like the best skateboarder ever. The the next week you're like a loser and nobody wants to hang out with you. So, yeah. it's Well, the problem with the ego is it only knows itself comparatively. Yeah. Like it doesn't have an essential quality of what makes it real because it's not real. It's all just projection. Yeah. So it's always just measuring compared to what it sees out there. So yeah. like you could think you're really good looking and then you go to a place where there's other good looking people who are like, I'm fucking ugly, says yeah. the ego, you know, like, <laughs> or I'm really good at this. Then you see other really good people like, I suck, yeah. you know, and it's always comparing. So it's never stable. It's yeah. never happy. It's just judging accordingly, pushing others down. How yeah. dare you do this? I'm better than you or, or, you know, or looking to try and climb. It's, it's just so funny. It's a, the most unstable yeah. mechanism that we have because yeah. it's always just kind of looking around yeah yeah and then so if you don't get past that then you'll be chasing a bunch of other stuff but then how you know how do you recommend people get to the core of what is important like, yeah what what are the what is the fucking thing if it's not the ego what is it that that really makes well a quick thing i'll say about the ego too that kind of 
kind of leads into an answer of that question is one of the most common questions I get is people are like, how do I stop comparing myself? Like, how do I stop, you know, caring if I'm prettier or uglier or taller or shorter or whatever? Like, how do I stop making those comparisons? And I think it's really important to understand that, like, you're never going to stop making those comparisons. Mm-hmm. What you can stop doing is taking them seriously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you can, what you can stop doing is giving a fuck about it. Like, you, you, could stop, you could stop listening. Like, like your little ego Trump is always going to be there, like, babbling into your head saying, like, oh, man, like, these people are way more successful than you are. But, like, you just have to be like, dude, shut up. Like, <laughs> I I know I don't I I get it I I know like it's, <laughs> I don't care you know yeah um so the, so the trick isn't you know just like because we're it's it's part of our anatomy you know yeah. this comparison stuff you know and, and it's good like it's good to compare things like it's good to know that like one car is a piece of shit and the other <laughs> one is not because you know like these things help our survival. Uh, but like what's important is to just, like you said, it's as as soon as we make it about us, like that's when it, that's when it gets dangerous. Um, but to answer your question, like how do we get to like kind of the core of, of what really matters? Um, you know, throughout the book, I kind of present like a series of, I guess, tools or mindsets or approaches to think about this question better. Um, one thing I specifically did in the book is I I didn't want to answer, specifically what people should value because because i think it's it i I wanted it to kind of be the opposite of most self-help books where they say like oh do step these four steps Mm -hmm. you know and and then your life will be great like i wanted values by elimination (laughs) yeah i i wanted to just help people ask the right questions and then i i didn't want to have anything to do with the answers um so there there are a few kind of approaches that i present um one of them you know and i think probably one of the most powerful ones to start out with is thinking about and, and stoicism talks about this buddhism talks about this but it's thinking about your own death um thinking about you know memento mori yeah if you got cancer or something what would you you know when you walk in that party and you're like wow everybody everybody's better looking at me like and that starts freaking you out you know just take a second and be like now if i had cancer how much would I care about this? You know, it's like, you're like, wow, I wouldn't care at all. In fact, I probably wouldn't even be here at this party right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'd probably be at home with my family or like Mm -hmm. talking to my friends. Um, and and so it's like that feeling when you just break up with your, with up with your girl and you're like, not with her. And you're like, what I wouldn't give yeah. that one hour. And you just squandered thousands of hours yeah. before, you know, and you're like, but just one hour to really appreciate her, you know? Yeah. It's it's funny how that how that'll that'll go when you have a perspective shift. Yeah, it's the same person, the same situation, but something else grave. Or if you're in love, you know, like truly in love. Yeah, you know, and then how that becomes so, and all the other stuff is like, oh yeah, my career and all that. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll get to that. It's all good. But like, I love this person. Yeah, you know, like let's fucking go for a walk in the park. Yeah, you know, I'll hold my meetings. Yeah, I'll do whatever. You it's know. it's. I mean, I I think, and that's kind of another thing I talk about in the book is is getting caught up, like our, our mind is always feeding us bullshit mm-hmm. um, about everything, and like we we really we're pretty biased in how we approach any situation, especially emotional situations, especially relationships, um, and so you know another chapter in the book is kind of about um, learning to not trust those things. Um, you know, I, I hear, I get a lot of emails and it's, I hate to say it, it's usually from women who talk about, <laughs> they'll have like a boyfriend who, when they're together, all he does is sit around and play video games and, and ignore her and like ditch her for his friends. And then as soon as she breaks up with him, he's like calling her every single day, like, oh, I miss you. I want to have you back. Mm-hmm. And then she takes him back and he's like, plays video games all day and like ditches her for his friends and then like she dumps them again and they just go through this cycle over and over and and it's funny like i i i mean i was there at one point so i'm I'm not being mean um but like it's it's funny to watch stuff like this because it's like all right you got this guy who i'm sure in his head he genuinely feels like 
you know, when he's single, he's like, oh, God, I'd give anything to be with her again. She was the best thing that ever happened to yeah. me. And then when he's with her, he, he's like, gosh, she's so annoying. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like <laughs> would she shut up for a little while? Like, <laughs> you know, and then her, she's probably playing these same stories out in her head. And, it, and it's really, it's just these, like, large emotional impulses and these stories that are getting weaved around them. Um, and, and you can't trust those stories. Like, you you have to like look beyond those stories and look at like what what the behavior is actually saying you mm-hmm. know it's like all right he says this and he says that and i feel this and i'm feeling that and i'm telling myself this story of like oh he can change and you know he had a really hard childhood and all this stuff and it's like he ignores you change is so hard man. it's like it's just change, it's just, change it's is like so plain fucking and hard. at the end of the day your boyfriend's <laughs> fucking ignoring you and it, it and like you don't have relationships. Yeah, for those people <laughs> trying to change someone else, like think how hard it is to change yourself. Yeah, man. It's so fucking hard to change yourself. Like, think you're gonna change somebody else? Yeah, Good like... luck. Good luck with that shit. Because it's super. It's super hard. It's and, so true, man. And yeah, I mean, I think those, and it can happen. Sometimes it happens externally. Sometimes the universe will dial in like just yeah. the right lesson that you need. You know, like something that you couldn't have. Maybe it's that stroke that you have or that heart attack that finally gets you to start yeah. eating and working out like the universe yeah. had to dial that in because you couldn't do it yeah and generally it, it kind of will like for one from one way or another that momentum will hit a tipping point and then you'll get it and that's the that's the breakup moment or that's yeah. the heart attack moment or that's the near-death experience moment but we also have the option to do that work ahead yeah ahead of time like put ourselves we have the imagination the the ability to kind of put ourselves in that position like Put yourself in the position where you don't have much time to live. Yeah. Put yourself in a position where your relationship is going to end and this is the last day that you're going to get to spend with somebody. Yeah. You'll just enjoy the fuck out of it <laughs> yeah. so much more. You know, It's like, all right, maybe you are tricking yourself. Maybe the likelihood that that's true isn't that high. But yeah. what's the result? The result is you live in the present moment and everything is full of awe and joy and magic and yeah. the kiss lights your face up with electricity. The smile of a stranger is like the glowing sun <laughs> when you've been in a dark winter. Like everything is awesome. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Use those techniques because yeah. it actually will be over at some point. You yeah. know, time is going to rip all this shit from us eventually. So yeah, use these things yeah. to put the perspective in the right place. The thing about change too in a relationship is you can't change well, you can't change a person and you and you can't change a relationship unless the other person wants to change and um bullshit i'm a wizard bro yeah it's like <laughs> i can, I watch, can spell cast yeah. whatever i want on somebody <laughs> i'm just gonna leave some breadcrumbs here and like he won't figure it out um yeah it's just i, I get i hear from so many people who you know that they're like my my partner is like this and he or she does that he works too much he doesn't pay attention to the kids and you know it's like how do i get him to change and i'm like <clears throat> if he's not changing like it, it's it's uh what you got the only way is for you to change and yeah. then for them to take a look over at you and be like damn oh, i want to enjoy life that much like <laughs> yeah. i want to be that happy yeah. like i want we really are responsible for how we show up yeah. You know, like how we are. Yeah. Because I remember I was trying to I was trying to get my parents to do psychedelics for like a long time. <laughs> I was giving them all the evidence and all the trial data and all of these fucking <laughs> results and talking to them about my experiences and super eager and trying to get them to go. Finally, I was just like, fuck it. My parents are never going to do psychedelics. So I come back from Peru after a great experience and I'm just like glowing with love for life. And yeah. and they're like, hey. We want to go to Peru. And I was like, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> you know, now, but really what it was is, you know, I stopped chasing. I stopped trying yeah. to get them. They had no reason to be defensive. And then they were able, because I wasn't trying to chase after them, you know, they relaxed their guard and they actually took a good look at me. And they're like, man, I want some of that in yeah. my life. And if that takes going to Peru and drinking some strange ancient plant medicine brews, like, <laughs> So be it. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. And yeah. I think that's the, the case not just with your parents but with any relationship. Just show up as that person yep. and then see if that wants – if they want to draw towards you or if that's so scary to them that it propels you apart. Yeah. And either way, it's a win you know, because you'll either find out if that person is right for you in your life yeah. as you express yourself as the best or you know whether they're going to come with you on this ride. Yeah. Well, and it's it's amazing too that sometimes – simply the acceptance of the other person 
is enough to maybe not make the relationship what you want it to be, but to get it to a good place. Like I, I, I had a pretty contentious relationship with my, my dad for most, pretty much all my teenage years and most like all my twenties. Um, and it was just looking back, it took me, it took me to, it wasn't until I was about 30 that I realized that I had this vision of like what dad, what a dad should be. Mm. And my father was failing that vision. <laughs> and so I was like constantly beating my head against the wall, you know, you know, arguing with him, talking to him, judging him, like doing all these things. And, and it, it just sucked. Like it, and it finally kind of reached a breaking point where I said, you know what? Fuck it. The guy's like 65. He is who he is. I I don't, I don't like every part of him, but overall I love him. Yeah. Um, and this is just how it's going to be. And as soon as I did that, like shit got way better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like <laughs> things got like three times better immediately. Yeah. Um, and it's funny now cause it's just like now when he does that stuff that used to drive me crazy or I used to like pick a fight about it. Now he does that. I just kind of like shrug. I'm like, ah, it's dad being dad. All right. You yeah. know, and, and you just move on with it. Cause it's like, especially with family members, uh, it, like you said, life's too short and, and you know, with parents and siblings and stuff like, you know, a lot of times you don't get to see them often. So like, you don't want to, you don't want to dwell and, and all that. You also don't want to re- reinforce those patterns. We we have this like kind of antiquated reward punishment model of how we should handle love. Yeah. Like somebody does something we don't like, we retract our love. Say, yeah. fuck you, you don't get any love right now. You yeah. Know? Which just creates more trauma and which is just going to exacerbate that same behavior, which is them being defensive because they don't feel like they're worthy and they want you to prove that you yeah. love them. But when you reverse that and when someone does – that worst behavior, that thing that you can't stand, you know, obviously have discretion. Don't allow somebody to trample all over you. But if it's a significant relationship and it's just that thing that, you know, forgive them immediately yeah. and just show them love and don't give them that response. And then all of a sudden you'll see them really shift. Yeah. You're like, whoa, I just did the most fucked up thing I could think about. <laughs> and all I got was love and forgiveness in yeah. return. It can create this really rapid rapid shift whereas if you withdraw the love and play that game again then you're still in this proof of love kind of game that'll never end so it's like it's counterintuitive but love is the thing that's going to heal that that situation and heal that other person and allow them to to be their best yeah yeah it's 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 a lot of times you know what you described of like Oh, they did something I didn't like, so I'm not going to show them. I'm going to punish them mm. to like reinforce. Not you know, I want to reinforce that that's bad behavior. Like that's the sort of shit you do with your dog. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, truly, truly. Like you don't do that with like a spouse. <laughs> and the only reason you do it with a dog is because like they don't understand. There's no. They have no other way of. Understanding. And they also have a really short memory. So, yeah, so they like. Too. So they don't like dwell on that shit forever. You know, it's not gonna be like years of drama. You know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. got it. It's true. And 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 if humans were a little bit more like that, like, and that's really, that's how we should be with everything. Like, quick reminder, like, hey, that didn't feel good, but I love you. Yeah. So like, quick thing, and then back to back to recovery. But this long drawn out retraction of love, that's what creates the real, yeah, the real poison. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, remind somebody, like, hey, that was not cool. Yeah. That was fucked up. You know, I really didn't appreciate that. But I love you and I forgive you. Over. Yeah. You know, done with. And that's the same way you should do with the dog. Like, if a dog shits on the rug, you know, I don't know if this is proper dog training technique, but have him look at the thing and shit and smack him on the butt. Yeah. And then fucking two minutes later, yeah, scratch his ears. I'm, Whatever. I'm you're, sure you're over with it. You're going to get like 15 angry emails from dog trainers. <laughs> I really don't know just, how to just, train a dog. Our like, dog is, a, is more like a cat. Like, I have no control like, over my dog. Aubrey, you're reinforcing <laughs> oppressive stereotypes of dogs all over the world. I don't know how to dog whisper. Help it, me. You know what's funny? It, some of the angriest emails I got about my book were I made a joke about halfway through the book. And it, and it's obvious. Like, my book is full of facetious ridiculous jokes yeah i mean it has fuck on the cover um i made a joke about a a pit bull eating 
a an infant like eating a child <laughs> uh-huh. and it is it's just like the most ludicrous like stupid sentence i got like six or seven angry emails from pitbull owners telling me that i'm reinforcing pitbull ownership stereotypes oh, no. and how like pitbull owners already deal with like all <laughs> oh, no. this prejudice i'm just like oh god is nothing is nothing <sighs> right. okay anymore right. like, is, <clears throat> is everything offensive <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. You know, but then the good thing is when everything becomes offensive, then nothing becomes offensive. No, that, like that's the that's ultimately the that, tipping point. That's the whole self-defeating thing about all this stuff is is it's like, yeah, when you get angry about everything, you just stop caring and then Trump gets elected. Like <laughs> because nobody cares anymore. It's like, oh, well, yeah. He talked about grabbing pussies. Like, well, we're mad about any, everything anyway, so let's <laughs> let's vote for the pussy guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and also, you know, like that, the blindness to our own ego allows some, us to elect someone with massive ego issues. Oh, yeah. You know, like to see somebody that purely in their ego. Yeah. Like, he's just like a pure ego. He being. is. It's like fucking incredible. Like the blindness that comes with yep. it, the delusion that comes with it, the constant need for validation. It's like he's just one giant ego testicle. Yeah. And it's just like <laughs> the only way that 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 gets put on the mountain is when we're oblivious to our own. Yep. You know, and so I, I mean I don't I think really the work is work on ourselves, become more aware of our own shit. Yep. You know, help other people become more aware. The politicians, that's just like a lagging indicator. Yeah, yeah, totally. And they really don't do that much. Like it's something to really stress about. Like let's just worry about the consciousness of the people. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then let that let that do what it may. Yeah. But it is a really interesting indicator that that's just something that we're we're not aware of. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And that's something, especially living here in New York, you know, you run run into a lot of like mega cocktail party liberals you know who are like how did this happen this isn't us and i'm like it is <laughs> yeah. it's like it totally is i mean it's, it's half the country voted for him it is mm-hmm. um and, and and you know people who say the same thing about hillary it's like yeah this is this is us they these are our representatives and and then but a lot of that is still playing those games of superiority. Like, we wouldn't do this. I am this type of thing. And yeah. these people who wouldn't do that. It's like, we're all just trying to figure shit out. We're yeah. all just in different levels of awareness. And you could easily be as, you know, blinded and deluded by your own ego and your own shit. Just you, just playing a different game of superiority. Yeah. Whether it's spiritual materialism or political materialism or some other way that you define yourself as better than others. It's no fucking different. Yeah. I mean, in, in politicians, their their only incentive is it, it's a popularity contest, essentially. And so, um, if a piece of shit wins a, a, an election, it, it's it's a reflection of the people, like where where they're at. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, man, interesting times. Yeah, what do you think when you look out? Like, what do you think of the things that are like the big the big levers? You know, obviously, you know, books, books help, but people got to no. read them. You know, what are, what are the things? Is this just going to be kind of a matriculation of ideas and thoughts that just kind of spread through a variety of mediums? Or is there kind of a bigger play to help kind of point people to some of these very basic kind of understandings of how to maneuver the mind? Well, I, I think I think one of the big problems right now is that things are fragmenting so much. I think that the internet has made it so that, you know, everybody can kind of close themselves off in their own little tribe and their own little community, um, which there are great aspects about that. But one of the, the negative side effects of that is that I think those big levers are disappearing. You know, like I think every, we're all, everything's becoming like a little bit of a bubble or an echo chamber. And so it's very, I think, 20, 30 years ago, it was much easier. If you had a big, great idea, Mm -hmm. it was much easier 20, 30 years ago to get that out across the entire population. Um, These days, I think that's, it's, they're kind of these like invisible barriers between beliefs, not just politics, but like beliefs, identities, communities, um, and and stuff is traveling across it less. Um, And so we've got this like weird paradoxical thing where we're becoming more connected 
but more uh almost more tribal more tribal and closed off and yeah um yeah it's funny actually i got an email i get these emails occasionally um i got an email like three days ago and it was a guy who was like uh hey my wife read your book it was like her favorite book last year she won't stop talking about it she wants me to read it but um before i buy it like tell me who you voted for in the last election i'm like what (laughs) i'm like how you know and it's basically what he's doing is he's like tell me tell me which tribe you're in yeah Um, are you my people are you not my people exactly and and i very consciously i mean i've let loose a little bit more on this podcast but on my website and and you know my kind of um my brand i guess you would call it like i try to not put myself in a in a tribe too much um i try to cross those lines as much as possible um because the lines are all fictitious oh totally they're all imaginary they're all just imaginary anyways you know even the political line all the lines everything is just it's all just people and people are all just (laughs) fucking gray you can't put them in a box that's Mm -hmm. one like real significant error of the mind yeah is to try and group things based upon a word symbol or some idea symbol yeah like everything is just all mixed and boundaryless Yeah. yeah Yeah, and it's, but it's those. There's certain, for whatever reason, there are. A, there's a certain class of imaginary lines that seem to be becoming. Much People are trying stronger. to pretend that they're real yes. because if they pretend they're real, then they can shit on everybody else outside yes. of that line. And it feels important. It and feels important. Yeah. And, okay. And, these are me. These are yeah. them. I'm. We're better than yeah. them. Yeah. But if you break all the lines, then what does the ego do? How does the ego judge whether it's better or worse? It doesn't. So it yeah. starts to freak out. So yeah. we're creating more and more lines. But ultimately, it's going farther and farther from the universal truth that we're all same, just living different lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think, I almost feel encouraged by how bad it's getting in some ways because it's like <laughs> i'm glad you we, are. <laughs> yeah because it has to get worse i feel like it has to get worse before it gets better it has it to get to does. the ridiculous it usually like does. once it's ridiculous yeah then everybody can go wow this is yeah. fucking ridiculous yeah it usually does the only thing i hope for is that you know throughout history when things get ridiculous a lot of people end up dying and um i hope that we can manage that <laughs> yeah. without <laughs> yeah ego murdering, death not mur- physical death murdering a lot of people yeah yeah hopefully we've transcended that <laughs> yeah. that impulse and that ability yeah. uh to do that but you know certainly there's examples where we haven't but generally i think if you look across the board you know things are getting better yeah people are getting more aware people are it's just the the visible the visibility into these tribal identities is yeah. just so much more available yeah. you know like we know about any little white supremacy rally or we yeah. know about any backlash against the muslim church we know about that like immediately yeah it was like 20 30 years ago like it would have to be pitched to the local news and the local news would have to send it up and then they'd have yeah. to decide whether they wanted to do it now it's just like out yeah and so it gives i think the impression of a lot more chaos than probably we yeah. realize it, it's definitely that's part of it. Part of it, I think, is a perceptual issue. You know, one one of my favorite things now is is I, I see these these news articles and 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 they'll say like, uh, you know, they'll they'll be like some actress who like said something publicly and it's like Twitter erupted and outrage, you know, and then they always have that like one, to- like asshole person, you know, like tweet like in, embedded in the article, like somebody's just saying something absolutely horrible, and. uh and then, of course, the whole article is kind of built around this idea that there's, like, all these angry people out there. And I actually – a couple of times I actually got curious. I'm like, I wonder how many, a- like, angry assholes there actually are. You know, because it's like every time yeah. I post something, I'm, it's probably the same with you. Anytime anybody puts something online, there's always, like, five assholes who sure. say awful stuff about <laughs> sure. you. So I, I actually got – Especially cu- the better a post does because then it yeah. reaches not your fans. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It just like stretches <laughs> out into the realm of assholedom. Yeah. And so I, I, I've gotten curious with a few of these. Like anytime I see like a, a tweet embedded in like a news article, I click on it and then I kind of like take a few minutes and search around Twitter to see how many – what this outrage actually is. And usually it's like two or three like – really awful people mm-hmm. saying awful things <laughs> and 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 then that's it and you know and then a bunch of people responding to them and you know the whole internet mm-hmm. like crap happens um 
but it's funny because this whole narrative gets spun as if there's this there's this controversy you know and and there's no controversy there's just a couple assholes and it's but by talking about it as if it's controversial you're actually giving these these like really extreme uh minor like like people and like there's almost none of them who actually exist you're giving them a huge bullhorn yeah. and making making their opinions seem way more influential and important than they actually are and i don't i think a lot of media online media like i think a lot of them they they just don't know they're doing this i think there's probably some people in media who know that this happens but they also know that this is really the only way you get like clicks mm-hmm. um in in ad revenue um well it, re- it kind of reflects how we handle our own trolls right like this is goes back to what you should give a fuck about and what you should not yeah. give a fuck you can post something great have 45 people who are like that was awesome man yeah. and then one person go like Ew, snore, snooze. That yeah. was, you know, blah, blah, blah. It say something. And hey, it'll be like, <laughs> fuck you, man. I put a lot into that. You know, or like cringe. Yeah. Yeah, blah. And, <clears throat> and, it, and it's interesting, you know, we'll, we'll take that one criticism and our, our ego will look for that evidence, yeah. you know, to get upset about, to get outraged about. You just can't give a fuck about that. Yeah. You know, you can't give a fuck about the stories, whether they're brought up, unless it's something that's really significant. And you, but you can, what we can focus on is the micro. Yeah. You know, like we can't stop CNN or Fox or whoever from running those <laughs> those stories. Yeah, you got to stop the people from wanting yeah. to hear them. Yeah, and stop yourself first. Yeah. You know, stop yourself first yeah. from having that disproportionate reaction to someone telling you that you suck. Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is. Even if it's someone who, you know, you really love and care about, yeah. you know, like that's going to be harder, of course. Yeah. But don't allow that to be something that, overwhelms your day and yeah. overwhelms your emotion like know know what you you're bringing you know who you are yeah and give a fuck about that not the other stuff sometimes i feel like we're all just going through like the growing pains or like a maturity we're like in our awkward teenage angry teenage years <laughs> yeah. of the internet of like you know the honeymoon periods over, you know, that, that childhood phase where like everything's amazing. It's like, Oh my God, I can like contact my, my friends from elementary school. And you know, like that excitement's all gone. Nobody cares about that anymore. (laughs) Now we're like, we're like, now that we're all actually connected, we realize like how much, maybe this comes back to the Bertrand Russell thing of like, maybe it's that being played out over a much longer scale of like, okay, now we're actually seeing what's in everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're terrified and <laughs> upset about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, and and we just n- need this like five to ten year period to like get over it and, <clears throat> and get through it. Um, I hope. Yeah, you know, and I, <laughs> I, really I, I hope. agree. And I, and I think there's a lot of people putting out bad advice. And I think one of yeah. the one of the bad advice things is use the haters as fuel. And I fucking hate when people yeah. say that advice because then that means that you're giving a real fuck yeah. about every time. Because every time you say that, to use it as fuel, you got to take in that insult and you got to let it burn and you yeah. got to make it let it make you angry and make you fired up. Like, no, yeah. like be fired up. What you want to use as fuel is the people you love, right? The things you love, what you're trying to accomplish, what your yeah. purpose is, who this is going to help, yeah. you know, how much you enjoy doing it. Not because somebody told you that, that you couldn't like, yeah. you don't want to be constantly searching outwardly for someone to shit on you so you can burn, put shit in your yeah. shit burning oven train, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to keep yourself going. It's yeah. terrible advice. Yeah. And, and I've seen this happen with, with like some online personalities, like people who kind of feed off of of the haters is what they end up doing is they just end up creating content for more haters. Yeah, because they, they need they need more shit for their shit burning oven. Yeah, yeah, they just need more controversy because they, they realize that that rewards them too. It's just like creating more controversy gets them more attention, and uh, I think it just takes them to like a really dark and miserable place. It does. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's uh, it's the it's effective in the short term, yeah. you know, like, cause it alchemizes a very negative, costly emotion yeah. and then allows you to transmute it into not into depression, which is very contractionary and, oh, yeah. well, but at least it moves into action. So it can be helpful and like, it should be used as like a stopgap. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those last resort, you know, yeah. 
all right, if we got to get moving better to rather than sitting in a dark room and crying and not doing anything, go out and prove them wrong. Like, yeah. But don't use that forever. Like, yeah. Use that as like a small crutch and then really continue moving based on what you love and yeah. based on what you what you're trying to attract. Yeah. Not the opposite. But I, but people get people get that twisted. And if they don't know how to make that transition, then, yeah. like you said, they're just going to be constantly creating more shit, and yeah. more hate and more stuff for them to deal with. Yeah, man. Yeah. That, that sucks. No. <laughs> no, it's it's not it's not optimal. And it's Is also it? it's also like, you know, in in uh in open relationship too, there's I'll no. draw another correlation to that. Like <clears throat> if someone if you're feeling insecure, yeah. you know, your lover is seeing someone that, you know, really challenges some aspect. Like I remember my fiance um started seeing a professional fighter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is really early on. And I was like, I started boxing more. And I started like, I, I can be a good fighter. Too. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's dumb. Yeah. Like, I just need to be happy that she's experiencing this thing yeah. and that, that he's awesome at that. And that's that's great. But, like, you can use whatever insecurity is to fuel your own ego and say, I'm going to be better. Right. I'm going to show her. Well, or you can say, no, we're in this so that we can both experience love as broadly and as widely as possible and good for her. Yeah. You know, and it's, and then that fuel, you know, using that love as fuel and using that to drive you into something positive is harder in some ways, Yeah, but also way more rewarding. Cause as I'm in there hitting the heavy bag and stressing, it feels good to get the energy out, but then I just sink back into this really negative feeling yeah. of feeling like I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I yeah. need to be better. I need to be better. I'm not good enough. And it doesn't work. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it feels good to win at games, but it feels better to not play games. <laughs> to not yes. even like, not yes. even join the game <laughs> yes. in the first place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and I say that as a very competitive person, and I've had areas in my life like that too, where it's like, you know, well, fuck them, I'm gonna show them, you know, and mm-hmm. and that has, like you said, that that has its place, that that can get you off the starting line, but you can't hold on to it forever. Um, yeah. You, at some point, you just got to be like, all right, this is just a game. Yeah. That I'm playing. Do you have any techniques for like really harnessing mental control? Like, let's say you know there's really one dark area of your mind that elicits like a <laughs> lot of fucking dark feelings and emotions and thoughts. Oh, and, there are many. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and your mind will just want to go there. Yeah. It'll like want to go mining for that feeling that'll release that flood of, you know, depressive, terrible, you know neurochemical cocktails that make you just feel like shit but your mind will be like hunting for that yeah and then you know really trying to work with how to just like all right maybe we don't need to go there yeah or maybe we do i mean do we just need to keep mining until there's nothing there or is there a way to just kind of steer our mind towards the more positive shit i i think i don't think you can you can steer towards the positive shit until you've explored yeah, kind of the dark territory. Um, I, mean, I haven't been able to. I was yeah. just hoping. <laughs> I was hoping maybe you had a solution because I just fucking keep just, going into the darkness yeah, till there's no darkness. Take left. this pill. <laughs> call me in the morning. Um, it, it, I wish it was simple. Um, I, you know, I think the most important thing, like I, I don't think those dark areas ever go away. I think what happens is, is they we learn to let them exert less influence over us. Mm -hmm. And I think the way we learn to do that is a, by exploring them, you know, whether that's through therapy, meditation, you know, talking to friends, loved ones, doing ayahuasca, whatever. Um, but like getting into it, seeing what it is, um, because you can't really learn to kind of let it, uh, let go of it or like let it stop influencing you until you, until you know what it actually is like where where is that darkness coming from it, like what's the insecurity or like mm-hmm. the fear that's underlying it um and to do that you have to get very like honest with yourself and like be willing to feel shitty for a while and um but then i think once you do that and once you kind of feel like you have a grasp of it um you know I, i'll use you know, kind of the most prominent example from my life like i had a lot of um, 
baggage and shit around romantic relationships. Um, you know, my, my parents, they split up and, and, um, the marriage wasn't good for a lot of my childhood and then they were divorced and then I lived with my mom and, um, there was all sorts of like crap that was going on. And so I kind of grew up, uh, spending a lot of my 20s like overcompensating basically like i was partying all the time i was chasing girls all the time like to the point where it was like i i think if, if you're a dude in your 20s like you should be chasing girls or mm-hmm. guys or whatever you you want to stick your dick into but like it, it's <laughs> not whatever you want to stick yeah, not, your dick not into. Anything. don't not, take them literally not anything. Just meant for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please i don't want to get 20 angry emails of like you're Here's all the things you shouldn't stick your dick into, <laughs> <Yeah>. Mark. <laughs> We're just going to have like a 20 page like disclaimer, disclaimer before yeah. this podcast. Um, <laughs> anything consenting that you want to stick your dick into. There we go. I think that covers everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think that it's a healthy time to do that. But I think, you know, for people like me, it became very compulsive. Sure. And it took me a number of years to realize that there was. A, you know, because I, I pursued sex very compulsively and then I was completely incapable of any sort of like deep, intimate relationship um, that lasted more than a couple months. And it took me a long time, A, to even realize that was the case, you know, because one, one thing when we're driven by those dark places is we think it's normal. We think everybody, we like our first line of defense with ourselves is we tell ourselves that everybody is like this, yeah. you know? So I was this, I was going out drinking five nights a week and dating four different girls. I'm like, yeah, every guy does this. Mm-hmm. And it's like, <clears throat> meanwhile, I'm like, you know, unemployed, broke, living on my buddy's couch, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, not, not everybody does this. Um, you know, it took, it took kind of like hitting some, like a rough patch to even recognize that like, Hey, my behavior is totally not normal. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it's excessive and it's compulsive. Um, and then I had to spend, uh, an, a few years kind of mining those insecurities. Like what are those insecurities? Like what, what triggers me and like, why would that trigger me? And, and then, you know, I went to therapy for a while. Um, an ex-girlfriend was like very helpful. Um, and, and she, she dealt with the brunt of my bullshit, but she helped me a lot because it, she was actually there to be like, Hey, you're responding completely irrationally. Um, you've got all this emotional shit going on. Like, let's, let's talk take about a look it. At it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and eventually after a while, I just realized like, Oh, this is an insecure area I have. This is a weakness of mine. Um, And I think, you know, the same way we all have physical strengths and physical weaknesses, like kind of different innate talent levels at different things. I think the same is true with emotionally. Some of us are really good at dealing with like anger. Yeah. Others are terrible at it. Some people are really good with intimacy. Others like have to work at it for a long time. Um, And so I kind of just realized like, oh, this is my weak area. Like this is where... This is where I'm sensitive and susceptible um, and that I have to like monitor myself and be careful. And so I don't think that part of me has ever gone away. I I don't expect it. I mean, if it does, that's great, but I don't expect it to go away. Mm -hmm. The only thing I expect is for my awareness of it to continue. Um, and, And basically the difference between me now and me, say, 10 years ago, is when some thoughts or impulses or anxieties come up for me, I'm like, oh yeah, that's my that's my intimacy thing. Yeah, I've been, I, I yeah, I recognize that. Yeah, I'm not gonna listen to that. You know, it's it's funny. Like, I think we're a lot better at knowing our physical limitations because there's tangible proof. Mm-hmm. Like, if you, you know you're not flexible in your hamstrings because you can go down and you yeah. can touch <laughs> and try and touch your toes, you yeah. know. And if you pull a hamstring, you're like, oh fuck, I really need to stretch more, you know. Yeah, like there's this kind of physical you have a physical metric but yeah. i think we we have this idea that we're mentally sexually romantically perfect that we yeah. can do the splits bench press 400 yeah. squat a thousand you know like <laughs> yeah. we think that we're these these perfect machines and so we don't accurately assess like oh yeah that's my weakness if i load up the bar the mental yeah. bar in this intimacy way or in this commitment way you know i got i can't only squat 10 pounds in yeah. that in that one whereas some things maybe in the you know 
friendship deadlift you yeah. can you can deadlift a house you know yeah. like but looking at it like all right there's some areas where i'm weak that i'll have to grow strong i'll have to start off yeah. light and know that if I, it gets too loaded i'm gonna break a little bit and and really just be aware and accept that and the sooner yeah. you surrender like the more you fight it and try to be perfect and be what you're not the more fucked up you're gonna be the oh, minute yeah. you're like oh yeah like i could really use some work in that area and there's gonna be people that are better yeah. than me in that and you know i'll learn from them and you know great yeah and just let it go and then accept yeah. who you are yeah as soon as you start saying like oh i don't have a dark place <laughs> that, that means it's controlling you. like yeah. it's pulling the strings That's what you're, the dark place says. You're, you're the puppet and it's pulling the strings right now and yeah. uh um yeah it, and it's funny too because it's such it's such like a simple and obvious thing but like we don't and it's one of those things that once you start thinking about it you see it everywhere you know like we all have we all have friends who are like you know a disaster in their job but like great friends and amazing family members and then you have other people who are like you know just emotionally wonky and cold but like they're amazing at whatever they do and and some people are great at self-discipline and some people are great at expressing themselves you know like it's it's all these things kind of come naturally to some people more than others um and it's and it's just it's just about like getting a sense like I, I don't know if you play video games i used to be a big gamer nerd yeah, so played, you know it's like you, you create like a world of warcraft character <laughs> like you know you you create a mage like he's gonna have awesome intellect yeah. but like weak physical strength like you know people are like that too yeah yeah That's, totally and and just recognizing that yeah you know i, I honestly think like the thing that's the most off-putting about a human is when they're pretending to be something they're not. Right. You know, it's like just gross. Like, ugh. Yeah. You know, but when you like fully accept who you are, yeah. whether it's how you look or how you act or what, where you're weak or where you're insecure or whatever it is, like if you just own it, you know, people will people will love the fuck out of you. Other people will own it too. Yeah. Other people will own it and yeah. they'll accept you completely. It's the ones that are like, you're resisting this thing, yeah. trying to put out this idea of, perfection because you can't handle the your ego can't handle the idea of anything less than perfection so you project this and people are like that shit ain't real yeah you know that is going to be the thing that repels you from from what you're looking for but just owning your shit yeah. and not wallowing in it not ruminating in it not trying to tell everybody about it all the yeah. time just like fucking own it it's there you know yeah. like it'll get a little better the more awareness you have and the attention and there's practices like you said med from everything from meditation to yoga or ecstatic dance or ayahuasca whatever the fuck you want to do yeah, whatever a million, works for whatever you. works whatever, for you whatever works. you know there'll be ways that you can subtly improve it, but just own yeah. your shit yeah. you know and don't try to don't try to be perfect especially like especially sexually people get so fucked up with that like yeah. we, we all really try to believe that we're lebron motherfucking james <laughs> <laughs> you know like i am lebron james in the bedroom <laughs> whoever i'm with you know we're not. Yeah. Guess what? Whoever you're listening, you're not. Yeah. You're not the fucking world's greatest lover. Well, and what's funny too is is you know I, I think, that's a thing in particular. I think dudes get all really hung up on that, especially sure. like, and I know I was like you know, for me it was like all right, I gotta be like LeBron James. I gotta learn every technique. You know, I gotta like I gotta have like every position down perfectly. You know, all this all this crap. Yeah. And and it's. It's funny, like the older I get, and like now I'm married, and and you know the more intimacy I've had, like the more I, I start to understand that I think sex it's more like music. Like totally. you you can be the best bluesgrass player on the planet, but if she doesn't like bluesgrass, <laughs> like it's not gonna go well. <laughs> yeah, you know. So it's uh, like it's like eighty percent subjective and like twenty percent like. Oh yeah, that guy's a good drummer. You know? Yeah. Well, it's like it would be like going into the venue and just you know not let's let's say you can play all kinds of music. Maybe you got fucking thrash metal in your yeah. in, in your game, right? Yeah. I mean, you also have some hip hop, some blues, yeah. some fucking classical. But you just go into whatever setting you're in, not looking at what the vibe is, what the yeah. setting is, what the people are actually wanting to hear, and you just fucking bust out your thrash metal in a jazz club, and they're like, "Whoa, man! Like thrash metal again? Yeah. Like, I'm not in the fucking thrash metal mood, you know? Or or maybe they are in a thrash yeah. metal mood, and you start playing classical piano as the mosh pit is going, and they're like, it's fucking mosh what pit the hell? time, man! Yeah. Why do you think I did that eight ball?" You know? so, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, so much of it is just is just listening, yeah. you know, and and just showing up and 
that kind of humble confidence of like, yeah, yeah let's, I'm fucking here to listen. Let's have some fun. Let's be in the moment and enjoy yeah. it and not try to, you know, show off your 360 dunk <laughs> every time. <laughs> you know, like maybe you'll get a chance for look, that. Honey. <laughs> look, honey. Did look it again. Can. It's like, yes, yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear. I've seen you do that dunk that, a thousand That's times. nice. That's nice. <laughs> for sure. Well, shit, man, it's been great having this chat with you, brother. Uh, yeah, man. I'm glad uh, glad we got to get together. Um, your blog is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's markmanson.net. Dot .net, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. People should check that out. Obviously, still buy your books. They're still, yeah. They're still killing it. They're still everywhere. What's so. next for you? Um, I'm actually, so I'm working on my next book, and uh, and then I'm actually working on a uh an audio project it's not it's not like a podcast but it's like a it's a thing with audible so it's kind of like an audio series cool or audio project um which is great like i'm super stoked for both but it's it's funny i feel like i took on two full-time jobs like i'm like working all day every day on the book and then i'm working like nights and weekends on the audible thing and i'm like fuck man i thought i thought i I thought i was past this it's like having twins yeah yeah (laughs) exactly but um both of those should be out within the next year year and a half what keeps you when when it's tough like that and you got all these things going on you know what do you think about what keeps you fired up to do that because obviously you've had you know really good financial success with this last book like what is it for you well you know what's funny is is after the book took off so much um it like it really messed with my head for for a little while like Mm -hmm. three six months um because it it, i mean it's literally like a my income like 10 x in like Mm -hmm. within a month um and and b you know i had all these kind of visions and dreams for myself you know i i wanted to have this long career as an author and it's like yeah one day i want to be like a new york times bestseller and one day i want to like sell a million books and and it all just happened in like (laughs) six months and so i was kind of like fuck what do i what do I do? Uh-huh. You know, like what, what's next? Um, and so I, I, a lot of 2017 was kind of me sitting around being like twiddling my thumbs being like, what the hell should I do with myself? Like I just accomplished like shit that I thought was going to take me 10 years to do it. Mm-hmm. I just like banged it all out. So, um, and then both of these projects fell in my lap and then there's another project in the works that I'm really excited about. So like all these, basically these three projects all just like, fell out of the sky within the same few months and so i'm just happy to take them i'm happy to be busy again um i don't mind doing tons of work um especially since i know it's it's temporary yeah um so it right now it's it's actually like i told my agent you know, you know she was like are you sure you can handle? i'm like i feel great like i'm i'm working yeah, again i'm like enjoying I'm, the process I'm energized of doing i'm it. getting up early like yeah so um so yeah, I'm just happy to be like creating again. That's awesome. I think that's a good sign of when you're on doing something that you're really here to do. Yep. You know, when the hammer's yeah. hammering the nails, 